Hello, and welcome to part 17 of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. In this episode, we dive deeper into Layer 6. But before we get started, I want to take a second to thank the members of the channel who have helped to make these videos possible. It's you who keep this channel going. Emily Sage, Ghost Twin In the year 1830, somewhere in Latvia, a 16-year-old woman named Emily Sage would begin her career as a French teacher at a boarding school, and this young teacher, over the course of her career, would become known as a dedicated, diligent, and maybe most important of all, adored by her students. So it's somewhat weird that this same teacher, who was so well loved, end up taking over 18 different teaching positions in just 16 years in countless schools. Was it because so many other teachers were envious of her? Or did she just get bored of the same job very quickly? Well, it seemed to be neither of these. Actually, the real reason is downright weird. She would take a job in 1845 at a place called Pensionet von Neu Elke, and it's here bizarre things would begin to occur. At first, it was simple things, like someone walking by her classroom and seeing Emily, and then seeing her a minute later somewhere else. And it would all be chalked up to hallucinations or the person just being mistaken. But similar instances would continue to occur, and as time went on, people began seeing Emily in two different spots much further apart. Like in one instance, when Emily left the classroom to go pick some flowers from the garden, the 42 students who had been sewing would kind of be bewildered when they seen Emily sitting back at her desk, because from the window, they could also see her picking flowers in the garden. Apparently, these students were brave enough, at least, to go up to this doppelganger. Some even reached out to touch it, and although it looked just like Emily in all regards, when they tried to touch her, their hands went through it, and they noted that it felt silky. The shocked students would tell Emily on her return, and she just seemed confused. Although, she did later state that while she was picking the flowers, she felt an urge to go back and check on the children. The weirdness went on over the year between 1845 and 1946, and the class dwindled from 42 students to 12 due to the parents pulling their daughters from school because of the strange events connected to Emily. The school would then in turn ask her to step down, which she sadly did, but she stated this was the 19th time, so it was hard to bear. When they asked what she meant, she revealed she had taught at 18 different schools in just 16 years which many have taken to mean that the weird doppelganger had been following her this whole time. So what to make of this? Well, it was originally published in 1860 by Robert Dale Owen in a book called Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World. He claimed to have direct testimony from one of the students, that of Julie D. Goldenstubby, who was actually a member of the nobility. Two authors would repeat the same story later after also talking to Julie. But, as far as real hard data on Emily, going by her age in 1845, that of 32 years old, she had to have been born around 1813, and checking records from Dijon in that year, where she was said to be born, revealed no families with the last name Sage, although there was a baby named Octavie Sage, the last name being spelled differently, but pronounced the same way in French. It's thought the name could have changed to protect the girl's identity. Or, it could have been that since the baby was born to an unknown father, the name was changed to hide her illegitimacy. Another thing that might poke a hoe in this story is the fact that in the previous 17 teaching jobs, nobody ever come forward to report anything weird. It was just at this one school. Finally, this institution where all this weird stuff was supposed to have occurred, well, no one even knows if it really existed, and if it did, they don't know where it was located. So, was this just a finely woven folktale, or was Emily the victim of a phenomenon called biolocation, one person being seen in two locations at once? Flyby Anomaly The flyby anomaly is an unexplained phenomenon observed in some spacecraft missions during close flybys of Earth or other celestial bodies. It refers to a discrepancy between the predicted and actual changes in the velocity of a spacecraft as it approaches 
and then departs from a planet or moon during the gravitational assist maneuver. Gravitational assists are often used in space exploration to increase a spacecraft's speed or change its trajectory by utilizing the gravitational pull of a celestial body. During these maneuvers, scientists and engineers calculate the expected change in velocity very precisely based on known gravitational principles and the spacecraft's position and velocity. However, in some cases, the actual change in velocity measured during the flyby is slightly different from what is predicted by classical physics and our understanding of gravitational interactions. Several spacecraft missions have experienced this anomaly, including the Galileo spacecraft during its Earth flybys in the early 1990s and the Rosetta spacecraft during its flybys of Earth and Mars. The flyby anomaly is characterized by a small but persistent discrepancy in the change in velocity, typically on the order of a few millimeters per second. And while that seems insignificant, it can accumulate over multiple flybys and impact the overall trajectory of the spacecraft. Scientists have proposed a couple of theories to explain it, such as it could simply be errors on the spacecraft's instruments, or more interestingly, some type of new physics dealing with gravity that is not yet understood. Fort Worth Missing Trio. This next one has a lot going on, and it's pretty long, but I summed it up the best I could for this short format. I did, however, make a deep dive for the members if you are so inclined. On the morning of December 23rd, 1974, 17-year-old Rachel Trelisa and 14-year-old Renee Wilson made plans to go to the Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth, Texas for some last-minute Christmas shopping. It was here that nine-year-old Julie Ann Mosley, who was Renee's boyfriend's little sister, would ask to tag along. The older girls informed her that she would need to go ask her mother first, to whom told Julie no, but relented after Julie complained about not having anyone to play with. She would then tell her to be back home by six, which worked out perfectly, because Rachel and Renee had planned to be back by four anyways, as Renee had a Christmas party to attend. The three would first head to a surplus store to pick up some layaway items that Renee had waiting on her. They then headed to the shopping center where they were seen by several witnesses. But strangely, the girls did not return home that evening, which caused a panic to her family, obviously, who in turn would all go searching for the girls around 6 p.m. It was then they found Rachel's car parked in the Sears upper level parking lot. And it's here we get our first bit of conflicting info. It's stated over and over that in the back seat lie all the Christmas presents the girls had bought, but that's not true. The only thing that lay back there was one wrapped gift for Rachel's stepson that she had brought along with them. Regardless, the police almost immediately said that the girls were runaways, something law enforcement seemed to do pretty often back then. But it's here that things got weird and creepy. The next day, Rachel, this 17-year-old still in high school, was actually married to a man named Tommy. He received a letter that appeared to have been written by Rachel. It read, I know I'm going to catch it, but we had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears' upper lot. Love, Rachel. And while that's odd on its own, it gets even weirder. Because the letter had been written in ink on a sheet of paper, while the envelope itself had been written with pencil. Also, it had been addressed to Thomas instead of Tommy, which is what Rachel called him. Furthermore, the postmark did not contain a city, only a blurry zip code that appeared to read 76083, but the three was backwards or it was a partial eight. No one was for sure. The families, who were beyond frustrated, end up hiring a private detective. This detective wasn't very successful, but it's actually what ends up happening to him that makes him interesting, because in 1979, this detective would die from a drug overdose and his death was ruled a suicide. However, he had ordered upon his death that all of the files on the Fort Worth Trio case be destroyed, which is certainly suspicious. Another private investigator, Dan James, was hired in 1996 and he got some pretty interesting tips. Maybe the weirdest was several credible witnesses told him they had seen Rachel since her alleged disappearance. Apparently, 
She had came into town for Christmas in 1998. She may have actually been coming in just about every Christmas. He found other weird tidbits too, such as Tommy had actually been engaged to Rachel's older sister Deborah first, and they broke up, and he immediately moved on to Rachel, whom then married very quickly. And here's the weird part. All three lived together in what was rumored to be a very tense situation, leading to at least one physical altercation, which happened just the day before Rachel vanished. The case, which had been code for decades, was reopened in 2001, when the newly assigned homicide detective stated that they now believe the girls actually left the mall with someone they trusted, and that they were seen with this individual. However, they also believe that one other individual was involved. Other than that, there's never been another update. Fullerton John Doe, November 28, 1987, Fullerton, California. A motorist driving a truck along the Orange Freeway, just south of Imperial Highway, would notice something strange on the side of the road, which seemed to be a man crouching and waiting. As the truck got nearer, this man jumped out in front of the truck and was hit. The driver called for help, but it was too late. This unnamed man was pronounced dead at the scene, and when police started looking for an ID, they couldn't find one, and this man, well, he would never be identified. What detectives could gather was he was about 30 to 45 years old, 6 foot tall, and was heavy set, around 250 pounds, and wore glasses. But maybe the most interesting thing that stuck out about this man, and most likely why he's on this iceberg, is the large oval-shaped burn scar he bore on his abdomen. Unfortunately, there's just not a lot out there on this one, so we'll move on. Gary DeVore Gary DeVore was a Hollywood screenwriter known mainly for his action films like The Dogs of War, although he got his start on shows like The Newlywed Game and The Steve Allen Show. But what he's most famous for is what exactly happened to him in the summer of 1997. You see, Gary had been suffering from writer's block, so on June 23rd of 1997, he decided to leave his home in Santa Barbara, California to go to his office in Santa Fe, New Mexico, about a 14-hour drive, to finish up a script. When he finally finished, five days later on June 28th, he would make the long drive back again, and that's where our mystery begins, because his wife Wendy, who was waiting on him at their beachfront home in Carpinteria, California, about 13 hours away, she would decide to call him to see how close he was, and she got into contact with him via his cell phone about 1.15 a.m. When he answered, he stated he was outside Barstow, California, although he wasn't very specific about where. But this phone call was the last time Wendy would speak to him, and strangely, it has never actually been found on a billing record, which indicates he may have not been using his own phone. Actually, some sources state that he was not using his phone, while others state he was, so I'm not sure which is true. Regardless, he would be reported missing by his wife, but he wasn't found, or at least not right away. It would be a full year later when both he and his Ford Explorer were discovered submerged below a bridge over the aqueduct in Palmdale, California. Police would pull the vehicle from the water and found a strange scene. First was Gary himself, who was obviously deceased, but oddly, his hands were missing, although hand bones were later found nearby but they could never be linked conclusively as belonging to Gary. Secondly, was his laptop, which was missing. It held part of the script he had been working on called The Big Steel. And finally, Gary's gun was nowhere to be found. The discovery of the vehicle was odd too, in the fact that this very aqueduct was searched shortly after his disappearance was reported, and nothing was found then, add into the fact that his car was actually found by an armchair detective who, following the newspaper account, went and searched the aqueduct and found the vehicle and DeVore. Detectives concluded that in order for DeVore to have crashed in this location, he would have had to have driven three miles against the traffic without being seen. This would have been twice as difficult since the vehicle's lights were turned off, and to this day, there's never been a good explanation to what happened to DeVore. Foul play can't be ruled out, but they also can't rule out that he just fell asleep at the wheel, but again, that doesn't explain why his gun and laptop were missing. 
or why there was no impact crater in the aqueduct. As far as theories go, there's some crazy ones. They range from Russian drug gangs being responsible to the CIA. This then ties into the rumors that government agents were seen entering Gary's house to remove information about this movie script just days after his disappearance, as well as multiple witnesses confirming that an unmarked black helicopter was taking pictures of the vehicle as it was being retrieved. So what was on this script? Apparently, it was about the United States invasion of Panama and the overthrow of dictator Manuel Noriega, as well as the enormous amounts of money laundering going on in Panamanian and U.S. banks. Furthermore, was the conspiracy that Noriega had set a honey trap for U.S. officials and that he had incriminating photos of senior U.S. officials that Noriega could use to blackmail them with, and that was the reason for the invasion. Apparently, DeVore was set to blow the lid off of this, which is why he was murdered. Geezer Bandit The Geezer Bandit is a man responsible for a series of bank robberies, at least 16, in Southern California. The robberies were committed between August 2009 and December 2011. The name came from the FBI and was attributed due to the suspect's age, that of a 60 to 70 year old man. His typical MO would be to enter the bank like a normal customer, approach the teller with a leather case or day planner while holding documents in his other hand that made it appear he was there to do a legitimate banking transaction. He would then draw a revolver from the case and demand money from the teller by handing a note. At least one of these notes content has been revealed and it simply stated, give me $50,000 or I will murder you. As mentioned, the man is thought to be 60 to 70 years old, which stands out as odd to detectives since it's not the typical crime one might see from that age range. So that's led to a theory that this actually was not an elderly man. It's thought that the robber may actually be a master of disguise and is using a silicone mask. At least one teller reported that the color of his face seemed off, like it was waxy, as well as noticing a small circular hole right in the center of the ear. This theory only got stronger after a white male in Ohio pled guilty to robbing banks in a mask which made him look like a black male. Due to this, the FBI would start questioning makers of special effects mask and hope her running down a lead, and detectives would serve a search warrant for at least one Hollywood mask company looking at the customers who purchased a mask called the Elder Mask, yet they did not find their man. On the final robbery, the die pack and the money bag exploded, causing the man to sprint off, running way faster than an elderly man might, indicating again that it was probably a disguise. The FBI has speculated that if it was, the man probably came up with a new one after the last robbery was foiled by the die pack and moved on to robbing other banks. Or, if it was truly an elderly man, he could be deceased by now. The man would be somewhere between his mid-70s to mid-80s. Finally, it's thought that either way, he possibly just got enough money and quit. Although, they stated that was very rare of bank robbers. But you can let me know what you think in the comments below. Old man? Or someone in disguise? German Headless Horse In February 2022, an interesting discovery was made in an ancient cemetery in the town of Nettlingen in southern Germany, that of the skeletal remains of a man buried 1400 years ago. But it's not the remains that are interesting, it's what he's buried next to, which was that of a headless horse, most likely owned by the man found buried next to it. The man was buried at a time during the Merovingian dynasty between 476 and 750 AD, which ruled over a large territory in what is now France and Central Europe. The man likely served the kings and was a member of the local elite. But even knowing that, no one really knows why he is buried next to a headless horse. But one theory has been proposed that the horse was decapitated as part of the burial ceremony and was then placed near its owner to go with him into the afterlife, but no one is for sure. Ghost Gunshot In February of 2022, a 38-year-old unnamed Swiss man was walking with his two children and an acquaintance in Frauenfeld, a town about 30 miles northeast of Zurich. As he walked, he all of a sudden felt a sharp pain in his lower body. 
Since he was unable to explain what was happening, he would head to the local hospital. Doctors would try to find the source of his ailment, and he was stunned when they told him he had been shot. Luckily, they were able to remove the projectile and treated his wound, but the man had no idea how he had been struck with a bullet. The police would get involved, and they couldn't find any leads either. No one in the area, nor the people he was walking with, heard a gunshot or saw a firearm. It was like it came from nowhere. Detectives stated they could not rule out accident, a crime, or that a shot had been fired from afar. While a weapons expert and CEO of Swiss Shooting Group stated that it had to be one of two things. He was shot with an air gun, or he was hit with a small caliber weapon from a very large distance. There was just no way it could have been done by a large caliber weapon because the damage would have been devastating and someone would have heard the gunshot. This is another one that there's just not a lot of info on, so we will move on. Guccifer 2.0 Guccifer 2.0 is the persona which claimed to be the hacker who gained access to the Democratic National Committee computer network and then leaked the documents to WikiLeaks. The documents, which also had bits of disinformation sprinkled in, has long been said to be an act of espionage by the Russian military agency, GRU. And it's here where our mystery comes in. Just who is Guccifer 2.0? Well, there's actually two theories on this one. Basically, the US has stated that Guccifer 2.0 is actually nothing more than a persona created to cover up for the interference into the 2016 election. In fact, Russia has often used personas to cover up for many of the covert operations once they have been busted. But it wasn't just the US who came out with these findings. Various intelligence agencies, as well as multiple private sector, cybersecurity firms, and individuals have looked into the claims and agreed that Guccifer 2.0 is a Russian intelligence agency. Of course, Russia denies they are behind Guccifer 2.0 and furthermore stated they had no link to him at all. And this is where the theory that Guccifer 2.0 is this independent actor based in Romania. The hacker has even been interviewed by Vice and he said he was from Romania, which is important because a very real hacker named Marcel Lehel Lazar had hacked several Romanian and US government officials as well as celebrities and was captured and imprisoned, and he went by the name Guccifer. So that's why this one went by Guccifer 2.0. Regardless, this Guccifer has always maintained in interviews, as well as emails, chats, etc., that he is not Russian. But in talking with him, anyone who speaks Romanian fluently is quick to point out that he had clunky grammar and terminology, and more than likely was using an online translator. In fact, even Julian Assange, who the leaks were given to, stated that it looked very much like they came from the Russians. However, the most damning clue came when Guccifer failed to activate his VPN client before logging in. As a result, he left a real Moscow-based IP address on the server log of an American social media company. U.S. investigators identified the hacker as one particular GRU officer working at the agency's headquarters in Moscow. So yeah, this one's not really a mystery. Gummy with a twist. This lost media mystery is about a screamer video that was posted on YouTube on September 23rd, 2007. The video started with the gummy bear song and video in Hungarian, but when the video made it to 24 seconds, the KFE auto commercial zombie then interrupts. Afterwards, an infamous message is screamed out. Now go change your shorts and get back to work. The video would start to take a lot of criticism because so many of the viewers that watched it and got scared were small children, which ultimately led to the creator deleting it from the platform. And surprisingly, this is one of the few videos like this that fell into total obscurity and was never seen again. Harappan Language The Harappan Language, also known as the Indus Valley Language or the Proto-Dravidian language is an ancient and undeciphered language that was spoken in the Indus Valley Civilization, one of the world's earliest urban civilizations. The Indus Valley Civilization existed around 3300 to 1300 BC in what is now modern-day Pakistan and Northwest India. 
Despite extensive archaeological evidence of the Indus Valley civilization, including inscriptions on seals and pottery, researchers have not been able to decipher the Harappan language. The script used in the inscriptions, known as the Indus script, consists of a set of symbols and signs, but its meaning and underlying linguistic structure remains a mystery. Several attempts have been made over the years to decipher the script, but none have been universally accepted. Some researchers have proposed that the language might be related to the Dravidian language family, which includes languages like Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, and Malayalam, spoken predominantly in South India and some parts of Sri Lanka. Other theories suggest that the script represents a lost language or a language unrelated to any known language. The lack of a bilingual inscription or a Rosetta Stone equivalent, which would provide a key to deciphering the script, has made it extremely challenging to make progress in understanding the Harappan language. Henrik Shiviak In the year 2000, a 45-year-old Polish man named Henrik Shiviak would be laid off from his job as an inspector at the Polish State Railways, which put a strain on his family. His wife worked as a school teacher, but that wasn't enough considering they had two children. Luckily, his sister lived in New York City, and he would take a flight to go visit her. After some time, he decided to stay there for a bit. Despite not having a work permit, he would begin working odd jobs and sending several hundred dollars back to his family every few months to help his wife and kids. His dream was to save enough to go back to Poland and build the family a new home. While in New York, he would try to learn English, but the process was slow and he really struggled to grasp it. But he kept at it, studying and watching American TV shows with his sister. Meanwhile, he worked at a construction site in Lower Manhattan until the job site suddenly closed down one morning. And why did it close? Well, Henrik was actually there on 9-11, so that whole part of the city was evacuated. But Henrik, who was very hardworking, refused to take any time off. He would go back to his sister's and immediately look through the classified ads of the Polish language newspaper. He found a cleaning service job at a supermarket. He then went to the employment agency of the Polish community. Henrik was told he could start work that night. He later talked to his wife back in Poland, who asked him to not go out because of the attacks on the World Trade Center, but he refused to listen. Unfortunately, the location of the supermarket was somewhere he had never been, so he asked his landlady to help by looking over the subway map. However, due to some miscommunication, the landlady sent him in the wrong direction. Further compounding the issue was Henrik did not even know who he was supposed to meet. So instead, he put on a camouflage jacket and pants and a pair of black boots and told the agency how he would be dressed and to look out for him. Before leaving, his landlady pleaded with him not to go because she knew it was a dangerous neighborhood that no one should go out into at night, especially with the nervousness of the city. But again, Henrik refused to listen. By 11 p.m., he got off the subway and began walking. One witness would later recall passing him as he was headed towards the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood, an area the NYPD considers as one of the most dangerous. To make matters worse, almost all of the police, many of who were called in for overtime, and some even called in from vacation, were all near ground zero, leaving most of the city unmonitored. And unfortunately for Henrik, that would lead to terrible consequences, because around 11.40 p.m., residents would hear an argument, followed by gunshots. Henrik would stagger to a staircase of a townhouse, where he rang a doorbell, leaving a trail of blood along the way. The resident of the building was too afraid to open the door in the wake of the gunfire, but they would dial 911. But it was too late, because Henrik walked back down the steps and collapsed face down in the street. He was pronounced dead at the scene, from a gunshot wound through the lung. As you can imagine, the NYPD was so tied up with the attacks that they really couldn't respond appropriately. A CSI, who would normally secure the area and collect forensic evidence, was unavailable. Instead, an evidence collection unit reserved for property crimes such as burglaries was sent. And instead of nine or so detectives who might canvass the neighborhood and talk to witnesses, only three could be spared. The only thing found were shell casings from a 40 caliber handgun. The shooter fired seven times, but hit him only once, and Henrik still had cash on him, suggesting that robbery was not the motive. So that leads us to theories. What could have happened to Henrik Shiviak? Well, one of the early theories put forward 
actually came from his wife. She believed that due to his dark hair, olive skin, heavily accented English, and camo fatigues, someone may have thought he was an Arab, leading to him being murdered by one of the angry citizens wanting revenge for the attacks. Detectives, on the other hand, have stated that they can't say that it was a hate crime because there's so little evidence available and no one from the community reported hearing anything like that and there were no witnesses. However, detectives have stated that due to his poor English, it could have played a role and theorize that it's possible he didn't understand someone was trying to rob him. In fact, as late as 2018, the cold case detective stated that the lead theory was still a botched robbery. Hestalin Lights If you have followed this channel for a while, you know I'm all about the spook lights, as we've covered many. However, these lights, which appear in the Hostalin Valley in a rural part of Norway, may be the craziest ones we've ever looked at. They are seen in both day and at night, and seem to float through and above the valley. The descriptions of the lights vary between accounts, so much so that some have speculated that it might actually be two different types of phenomena. The categories of light vary in the following. Sometimes, it's a white or bluish white flashing light that are usually high up in the air, closer to the mountains or higher, usually just a few short seconds or sometimes up to a minute, but rarely any longer. Then we have the yellow light with red on top, where sometimes the red can be seen flashing. Then there's the occasional sighting of a black object with a light on each end sometimes three lights. Finally, the most common sighting, that of a yellow or white light, can be seen setting in the same spot for over an hour, or moving around slowly down in the valley before it stops for minutes and moves again. The shape is often round as a ball, but sometimes can be seen in other shapes. The first reported sightings occurred in the 1930s, but the time frame that they actually become popular was between December 1981 to mid-1984, and that's because, at this time period, the lights were being seen anywhere from 15 to 20 times a week. It became so dependable that it started drawing in overnight tourists. There's been many attempts to study the origin of the lights, particularly that of a group of students, engineers, and journalists in 1997 and 1998, which actually end up recording lights in a pyramid shape that bounced up and down. And although some of these studies were able to identify a few of the sightings as misconceptions of car headlights, aircraft, and mirages, the vast majority have never been explained. Although, that hasn't stopped theories, such as the not completely understood combustion of airborne dust from mining in the area. It's thought that it happens because of the large deposits of scandium there. Another theory is that the lights are formed from a cluster of macroscopic Coulomb crystals in a plasma produced by the ionization of air and dust by alpha particles during radon decay in a dusty atmosphere. Finally, it could also be the product of piezoelectricity, which is an electric charge that accumulates under specific rock strains, like crystal rocks, which there are many of in the Hest Island Valley, such as quartz gains, that produce an intense charge density, kind of like the landscape acting like a natural battery which discharges at regular intervals. Hodge Conjecture The Hodge Conjecture is a significant unsolved problem in the field of algebraic geometry and algebraic topology, particularly within the realm of complex algebraic varieties. It was formulated by the American mathematician William V. D. Hodge in the 1950s. In simpler terms, the Hodge Conjecture is a mathematical puzzle that ask whether every complex geometric shape, a mathematical object, called an algebraic variety, can be fully understood and described using a combination of simpler shapes. It's like asking whether you can always break down a complicated shape in a specific area of mathematics called algebraic geometry into simpler shapes in a neat and organized way. It's like trying to take a complex jigsaw puzzle and showing that it's made up of smaller, well-fitting pieces this idea is important in algebraic geometry, a branch of mathematics that studies geometric shapes defined by equations. The Hodge conjecture has deep connections with various areas of mathematics, including algebraic geometry, topology, and number theory. Its evolution would have profound implications 
for our understanding of these fields. Despite many decades of effort by some of the world's most brilliant mathematicians, the Hodge conjecture remains unsolved. Investor Boat Murders September 5th, 1982 Craig, Alaska 28-year-old Mark Cothurst, the captain of a fishing vessel called the Investor, was wrapping up the fishing season with a nice haul of salmon before taking the ship back to dock. Accompanying Mark was his 28-year-old wife, Irene, and their two children, five and four-year-old Kimberly and John, along with Mike Stewart, who was his cousin, Jerome Keown, and Dean Moon, all of who were 19, and Chris Heyman, the 18-year-old. After returning, Mark and his family would go to a local restaurant to celebrate his birthday, while Dean Moon and Jerome Keown met up with another fisherman named John Peel to purchase drugs. Peel knew of this crew at one time, as he had actually worked aboard the Investor. Later that night, Mark and his family would return back to the boat. We know this because the two boats next to Mark's had been having a party to close out the fishing season and seen them returning. The next morning is when this starts to get a little weird, as a crew member of another boat walking along the dock noticed the Investor was slowly drifting out into the water. He then seen someone piloting it who waved as he sailed off. About an hour later, at 7.30 a.m., a crewman of another boat would also see the Investor anchored down at an island across the harbor from Craig. Now what makes this strange is right around this same time, a skiff from the Investor was spotted back at the storage dock in Craig, where it remained the rest of the day. Now, the next part gets weirder, because a fisherman would spot the Investor at the same exact spot the next morning at around 7.30. And again, they assume Mark got an early jump on everyone. Meanwhile, back in Craig, a 20 or 21 year old man was seen purchasing two and a half gallons of gasoline before departing back out on the skiff left at the dock the day before. That small boat then headed back out towards the investor and it's that afternoon around 4 p.m. another fisherman would sight smoke coming from the investor. The police were called, but during the meantime, the man that witnessed the smoke the captain of the casino inched closer to see if anyone was on board that needed help, and the captain would be surprised to see that the same skiff seen earlier was frantically leaving the investor. The casino would blow the horn for him to stop, while the captain yelled for him, but the smaller boat ignored the pleas. The captain almost had to ram him to get him to stop. He would then ask if anyone was aboard, to which the young man stated, yes, there are people on that boat, before he sped off. By the time emergency personnel arrived on scene, the fire was out of control. They eventually caught in a tugboat with a pump attached to it to help to get the fire under control. And finally, about three hours later, around 7.30, the fire was out. An arson investigator was requested immediately. Once aboard the now destroyed ship, the detective found the remains of Mark, his wife Irene, their daughter Kimberly, and his cousin Mike Stewart. All had suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Strangely, the fire would kick back up and the boat had to be abandoned again. The next day, as the boat continued to burn, the decision was made to bring a helicopter in to dump water on it. Now, after letting the boat burn for an entire night, they would haul it back to the shore. The investigation would begin and now detectives found the remains of Jerome Keon, while various other remains found could never be determined to be that of Chris Heyman or Dean Moon but the fact they were last seen there and never spotted again means it was most likely them. Likewise, the remains of the five-year-old John were never found, and it's assumed he burned up in the fire. That's a total of eight people murdered. A theory was soon formed. Whoever done this had lay in wait for the Cothurst family to return and ambush them. No gunshots were heard because of the parties going on nearby. Likewise, the seacocks were open, meaning that whoever done this may have thought opening them and anchoring the boat would cause it to sink. When it didn't, they went back out to burn it. The police didn't get anywhere for a year, but they eventually released a detailed sketch of the man, and several people came forward stating that it was John Peel, the man the boys had purchased drugs from, and he would eventually be arrested two years after the murders. But the evidence was circumstantial. He sort of looked like the witness descriptions, and the motive was said to be that he had been fired by Mark previously for drug use. However, 
The trial ended in acquittal, and the retrial ended with a not guilty verdict. There was just no evidence there, and too many contradictory witness accounts, plus sloppy police work, and the case remains unsolved. James Spallin, November 14th, 1856, in Dublin, Ireland, a chief cashier for the city's Broadstone Railway Terminal, named George Little, failed to report to his morning shift, which was seen as odd by people that knew him, since he was such a dependable guy. So his colleagues, finding his office door locked, proceeded to break it down. It's here. They found George lying in a pool of blood. His throat had been cut, and his head battered beyond recognition. Around the room lay piles of cash, hundreds of pounds of gold and silver, and strangely, the door had been locked from the inside. The whole scene was confusing to say the least. Robbery at first wasn't thought to be the motive because of all the untouched loot laying around the room, but they soon found that the perp had emptied three cash boxes. And this is a really old case, but in 2021, author Thomas Morris would dig through the National Archives and found a cache of documents about the unsolved murder. Even interviews from persons of interest remained on file. Unfortunately, from the other documents though, it was found that dozens of people, from railroad employees to curious members of the public, had trampled the crime scene. The investigator in charge was a man named Augustus Guy, and he learned that George Little had been working late the day that he was killed, staying in the office after other company officials left for the day, yet that night had seen thousands of passengers due to an annual horse fair, so an unusually large amount of money was left for George to count. And it's here the detective guy learned with those cash boxes that had been emptied, that equaled an amount about 10 times what a laborer would take in a year. The detective would interview more than 40 employees. Several were caught in lies about where they were on the night of the murder, but he was able to narrow it down to 14 persons of interest. The station was then torn apart, looking for clues, dismantling entire locomotives. Finally, after the Royal Canal was drained, which ran by the station, the murder weapons were found, a hammer and a cutthroat razor. This eventually led to five different suspects being arrested and released. Now you may be wondering, the title to this mystery is James Spallin, yet the murder victim is George Little. What gives? Well. A local woman named Mary Spallin would eventually come forward to detectives and cited that she knew who the murderer was and that it was her husband, James. Now, James would eventually be captured and would be taken to trial where he was acquitted, largely due to the fact that he and his wife's relationship was toxic and they couldn't be sure she wasn't just making up the story to ruin James's life. But it's here the story takes a strange turn when a man named Frederick Bridges entered onto the scene. Bridges was a phrenologist, and phrenology is supposed to be the ability to study one's character and abilities just by the size and shape of their cranium, which is largely known as pseudoscience. However, Bridges totally believed it, and he professed to be an expert. He claimed that since one could tell this information just by the pattern of bumps and ridges unique to each skull, a murderous brain would be unique enough that finding the killer would be easy. And after James was acquitted, Bridges saw an opportunity. He searched for the man and eventually found him, now destitute, and he befriended him and eventually convinced him to let him examine his skull, which must have been a pretty interesting conversation to have. Regardless, Bridges examined James' skull and was now convinced he was guilty. This was the man responsible for the murder. He would reach out to people in government and actually found a few people at the very top receptive to his ideas. However, any support soon faded away, and phrenology was largely discredited just a few years later and mostly forgotten. But it's left many to wonder, what if Spallin was truly responsible? Jeffrey Gebhardt, September 2012, in Blairsville, Georgia, a small town near the South Carolina-Tennessee border, a man named Jeffrey Gebhardt would embark with a friend on a camping slash hunting trip into the Clarks Hill Wildlife Management Area. The pair intended to stay for three days in the nearly 13,000 acres and were just two of the nearly 290 participants in this event. They arrived to the Holiday Park area to camp on September 21st. The two then spent most of the day together in this heavily forested region looking for any game they could find. The two at one point 
lost contact with one another, but they would reunite. That evening, when Jeffrey hitched a ride back with another hunter he had met on this journey, the next day started out basically the same, and just like the day before, both men got separated again. This time, however, it wasn't as easy to find one another. Actually, hours would begin to pass, and Jeffrey had still not returned to camp. Jeffrey's unnamed friend eventually decided to call the police at 10:12 p.m. Now, unbeknownst to Jeffrey's friend, Jeffrey had actually been in contact with the same police department. He had called their emergency number more than once. He would tell them he was hunting in Clark's Hill Wildlife Management Area and was now lost. However, it seemed like he had poor cell phone signal because he struggled to maintain a full conversation with the dispatcher. But authorities had enough information to send out a search party, which included the sheriff's department, the fire department, rangers from the Department of Natural Resources, along with numerous volunteers. They used flashlights, spotlights, police lights, and sirens to try and give Jeffrey a location to walk towards. When this didn't work, they were eventually able to find Jeffrey's approximate location using the GPS signals from his phone. A few hours later, after not finding Jeffrey, a helicopter was dispatched by the state patrol to scope out the area where the cell phone pinged. The helicopter, which was equipped with heat-seeking technology, would begin searching for a human-shaped figure in the dark. Finally, about 2 a.m., the heat signature of a man was detected in a marshy area. The rescue team would then be dispatched to the location and made it there about an hour later at 3 a.m. And it was here they came across an odd scene. There lie Jeffrey Gebhardt, dead. He had been stabbed numerous times in the chest and torso. Even stranger, looking around the crime scene revealed no footprints or any clue that someone else had been there. Once Jeffrey's body was back for an autopsy, it was announced that it was being investigated as a homicide, obviously. But after this, the police department went eerily quiet, rarely talking about the investigation. Although, one thing puzzled many townsfolk in the area. That is, the sheriff stated and insisted that there was no threat of a repeat offense, that this was not some serial killer who was stalking lone hunters out in the woods. In fact, Sheriff Moore would take it a step further and claim that there was not a killer on the loose at all. It would be in December, three months after Jeffrey's death, that the sheriff stated they were close to coming to a conclusion in the case, an unusual case. As it was, they were waiting on results from the crime lab. However, months would pass without another update. It would actually be close to a full year in August 2013, when a grand jury would convene to take a look at the evidence police had spent the past year collecting and make a decision on if police should close the case or keep investigating. The grand jury was presented with the November 2012 results from the Georgia State Crime Lab that stated Jeffrey had committed suicide. Of the 17 stab wounds, all of which were in an upward direction, the majority were superficial. Only three pierced his heart, while a fourth penetrated into his abdomen. Along with this information was a knife recovered next to Jeffrey's body, which when tested, revealed that Jeffrey was the only one to have touched it. The grand jury, after close to two days' deliberation, ruled that Jeffrey had died by suicide. Of course, this did not set well with Jeffrey's loved ones, who not only asked why he would commit suicide, but why out in the middle of the woods on a hunting trip hours from home, especially a prolonged death that took hours, and why call 911 saying he was lost, and of course, the elephant in the room, why not use the hunting rifle? The case was looked at again in 2023, and once again, it was ruled a suicide by the grand jury, citing the months of depression Jeffrey had been going through. However, his family still believes he was ambushed. Cryptos. Cryptos is a sculpture made by artist Jim Sanborn that stands on the ground of the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. It was revealed on November 3rd, 1990, and is made of four large copper plates and has a prominent vertical S-shaped copper screen resembling a scroll or a piece of paper emerging from a computer printer, which of half consists of encrypted text. The name comes from the ancient Greek word for hidden, and the theme of the sculpture is intelligence gathering. The characters are all found within the 26 letters of the alphabet, along with question marks. It contains four separate messages, three of which have been deciphered. The fourth has still not been cracked. It has 97 characters, and Sanborn has given clues over the years to help decipher it. But cryptanalysts and enthusiasts 
still haven't come up with an answer, despite the fact that the CIA has held a few competitions to encourage the public's involvement in solving it. Lady of the Dunes. Good news, all. This one is no longer unsolved. The Lady of the Dunes was an unidentified murder victim found in the Race Point Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts on July 26, 1974. There's long been a fascination with this case that attracted many armchair sleuths, but it was Halloween 2022 when the FBI announced she had officially been identified as Ruth Marie Terry. And almost a year later, on August 28, 2023, her husband, Guy Motivan, was named as her killer, and he had also been linked to a number of disappearances and other murders. Unfortunately, he could not be arrested, as he has been deceased since 2002. Lincoln Pool Pooper. Oh man, are we back on these again? Seriously? This time, it's in September of 2018, when a woman at East Ridge Pool in Lincoln, Nebraska, would walk behind a concession stand during the middle of a day to do a number two. It was caught clearly on camera, and the pool manager would actually ask for help in identifying the woman. And you may be thinking, maybe it was just a one-time thing. Maybe she was sick. But actually, no. She had been doing this for five years, stopping during the spring before the pool opened and in the fall after it closed. Well, at least she is regular. Lunar Swirls Lunar Swirls, also known as Lunar Swirl Patterns or simply Swirls, are distinctive, enigmatic, and often brightly colored features found on the surface of the moon. They are characterized by their curving shapes and their contrast with the surrounding lunar terrain. Lunar swirls have puzzled scientists for many years, and their origins are unknown. They typically appear as bright, curvy patterns on the moon's surface. They often have a lighter color compared to the surrounding lunar soil, which tends to be darker. The exact composition of the lunar swirls is unknown, but they are believed to consist of a combination of different materials, including finely ground lunar dust. However, the specific factors that cause them to appear brighter or differently colored is still a mystery. One prevailing theory about the swirls is that they are associated with local variations in the moon's magnetic field. It is thought that these magnetic anomalies might shield the surface from the solar wind, a stream of changed particles from the sun, which can darken the lunar regolith over time. Some scientists speculate that the brighter appearance of lunar swirls may be due to a protective effect against space weathering if the magnetic anomalies indeed protect the surface from the solar wind and cosmic rays. This might result in less darkening and alteration of the surface materials. The exact origin of the magnetic anomalies that give rise to lunar swirls is unknown too, but it is thought that they might be associated with ancient lava flows or impact events that created localized magnetic fields. Malakia Logan, May 15, 1988, Greenwood, South Carolina. Eight-year-old Malakia Logan, known by her nickname, Kia, and her sister and a friend, went to play at the apartment complex's basketball court just 300 yards away from their apartment. At around 8.15 p.m., she jumped on her bicycle and intended to make the short ride home while her sister remained at the court. It wouldn't be until her sister arrived a half hour later did anyone realize Kia was missing. Kia's mother, Renee, urgently looked for her around the apartment complex, but found no sign of her, but her bike would be found later, just outside the apartment office. The police were called immediately, and a deputy arrived on scene pretty quickly. He stated later he had a gut feeling something bad had happened. That deputy, Dennis Buford, would actually spend the night on the couch of the Logan family, waiting for a ransom phone call, or maybe even a call from Kia herself, but that call never came. The next day, about 75 people came together to search the area around the apartment complex. Helicopters were also brought in as well, and still not one sign of Kia. It's then that potential witnesses would start to be tracked down by police. Authorities announced they were looking for two men seen in the vicinity of the apartment at the time of her disappearance. They were not immediately believed to be suspects, but detectives did want to speak with them. The first was an older white man with graying hair driving a blue utility-type van with dark tinted windows. 
The second person of interest was seen driving a dark older model Monte Carlo, but neither of these men were found. One promising lead did come in three days later though, after a composite sketch of one of the men was made. The sketch came from a sighting of the second person of interest in the Monte Carlo. He was described as being between 35 and 40 with slender and pointed facial features, five foot eight or five foot nine, and a slight build about 150 pounds. Dark blonde or brown hair having a light glow to it. But the biggest feature was the man had a pockmarked face. The next day, the sheriff's department would state that the leads have now carried the investigation outside of the Greenwood area and that there were leads as far away as California. But sadly, after this, the leads dried up and the case went cold. That is, until two years later, on October 1st, 1990, when a hunter would find a skull in a wooded area on U.S. Forest Service property in Newbury County, about 40 miles away. It would be until 1998, 10 years after she vanished, for DNA testing to advance enough to identify the remains as belonging to Kia. The FBI, who were key in identifying the skull, theorized that she had been killed originally in Greenwood and then dumped in Newbury. Between the years of waiting on identification of the skull, Georgia and South Carolina investigators began looking at a number of sexual assaults that happened along a specific interstate between 1995 and 1996. These victims were all around the same age as Kia. They were also black, except for one victim who had olive colored skin with dark features. They all lived close to the highway in question and were abducted and taken to another location. After the assault, they would be left abandoned in a public setting. After the third or fourth one, police were able to link all the cases together, and in each case, a middle-aged white man with gray stubble and a pockmarked complexion with a unique tattoo on his bicep, which the victims described as a dragon or snake, was the man responsible. This would eventually lead to charges four years later in 2002, when 50-year-old Charles Wade Hampton, a man five foot eight, 132 pounds, with graying stubble and a pockmarked face. He also had a snake tattoo on his upper arm. Now this moron here would actually confess to being responsible for the assault and murder of Kia, as well as stating he had murdered two more and abducted several others. However, advanced DNA ruled him out. Seemingly, Charles had lied about everything for better jail accommodations. Detectives today have largely ruled him out altogether and now believe this was just a crime of opportunity. Sadly, no other persons of interest were ever named. Mantell UFO Incident January 7th, 1948, Gobman Army Airfield at Fort Knox, Kentucky would receive a report from the Kentucky Highway Patrol about an unusual aerial object spotted near Madisonville. The object, which was circular, about 250 to 300 feet in diameter, was heading west and reports from both Owensboro and Irvington came in. At around 1.45 p.m., Sergeant Quentin Blackwell would see the object from his position in the control tower at Fort Knox. Two other witnesses would also report seeing a white object in the distance. The base commander reported it was very white and about a fourth the size of the moon. Through binoculars, they were able to see that it had a red border at the bottom, but it would remain stationary for an hour and a half. Meanwhile, other observers just north in Ohio would report that the object had an appearance of a flaring red cone trailing gaseous green mist and they observed it for 35 minutes. It then came very near to the ground, stayed 10 seconds and climbed back at a very fast rate back to its original altitude around 10,000 feet high and then disappeared, estimated to be flying more than 500 mile an hour. It was then that 451D Mustangs of Seaflight 165th Fighter Squadron Kentucky National Guard was dispatched to approach the object. One pilot was that of Captain Thomas Mantell. Meanwhile, Sergeant Blackwell would stay in radio communication with pilots throughout the event. One pilot's aircraft was low on fuel and quickly returned to the base. The other two accompanied Mantell in pursuit of the object. They later described it as so small and indistinct they could not identify it. Captain Mantell would ignore suggestions that the pilot should level their altitude to more clearly see the object. And it's here we get a bit of conflicting accounts. 
Some of the air traffic controllers said they heard Mantell describe the object as looking metallic and being of a tremendous size, while other air traffic controllers reported hearing nothing like that at all. Meanwhile, only one of Mantell's wingmen, Lieutenant Albert Clements, had an oxygen mask, and his oxygen was low in supply, so he and Lieutenant Hammond called off their pursuit at 22,000 feet. Mantell continued to climb, however. According to the U.S. Air Force, at 25,000 feet, he blacked out from lack of oxygen and his plane spiraled back down towards the ground. His plane crashed at a farm south of Franklin on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Firemen pulled him from the wreckage, his seatbelt was shredded, and his wristwatch had stopped at 3.18 p.m., the time of the crash. Meanwhile, the UFO had vanished by 3.50 p.m. This, of course, generated a huge buzz around the nation. Some people claimed it was a spacecraft that shot Mantell's fighter down when it got too close. Others speculated that it was a Soviet missile. There were even rumors that Captain Mantell's body was riddled with bullets, or in some accounts, his body was never recovered, or the plane had been disintegrated, or the wreckage was radioactive. However, the Air Force disputed these claims. The crash would actually be investigated by Project Sign, the first Air Force research group assigned to investigate UFO reports. They would come up with a theory pretty quickly. They surmised that what everyone was really seeing was the planet Venus. Yeah, I know that sounds pretty lame. However, this was ordered to be looked at again, just four years later, in 1952. This time, they brought in an expert, that of Professor J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer from Ohio State, who stated that the Venus explanation didn't hold up because it wasn't bright enough to be seen in the sky that night. Furthermore, a considerable haze was present that night, which would have obscured the planet in the sky. Finally, Venus would have appeared as about the size of a pinpoint, whereas witnesses described it as a large object in the sky, which takes us to theories. After the Venus explanation was dismissed, Project Sign investigators began looking at the possibility that it was a U.S. Navy skyhook weather balloon, a suggestion that had been put forth by Hynek. A weather balloon had been seen by telescope by at least one observer in Madisonville that night, while it was also spotted by an astronomer between 4.30 and 4.45 at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. However, going against this theory was no particular balloon could ever be conclusively identified as being in the area that night. Matt and Wendy Jameson's Money November 12th, 1995 in Fair Oaks, California Matt and Wendy Jameson would return home from church to make a bizarre discovery in their backyard, that of a large amount of $20 bills that had been dumped over their fence and scattered over a few properties of other neighbors. After they collected what had been dumped, they started counting and came up with $6,500, or about $13,000 in today's money. The crazy part of this was, other neighbors had already collected huge sums of money from their yards as well, but a total on the amount of money lying in the neighborhood is unknown. But back to the Jamesons. They were unsure of what to do with the money, if they should keep it or tell the police. But they eventually decided on taking it to the authorities and told them the story. They would be informed that California law required them to place an ad in the newspaper about the money, which after 90 days, no one collected. One of the early crazy theories was that the money had been thrown out of an airplane by someone possibly involved in the drug trade or money laundering, while another cited the possibility of someone involved in the drug trade in the neighborhood and felt that the police were closing in on them and they made a run for it and started getting rid of the money as not to be found with any evidence on them. Mind-Body Problem The mind-body problem is a philosophical question that explores the relationship between the mind, consciousness, and mental experiences, and the body, physical matter including the brain. It asks about mental phenomena such as thoughts, emotions, and consciousness related to the physical processes occurring in the brain and body. There are several different theories addressing the mind-body mystery. First is dualism, which states that the mind and body are fundamentally different substances. Rene Descartes, a famous philosopher, proposed this view and famously stated, I think, therefore I am. He believed that the mind and body are distinct, with the mind being non-physical and the body being physical. While the theory of materialism asserts that everything, including the mind and consciousness, can be explained by physical processes. According to this view, mental phenomena are the results of complex interactions 
among neurons and other physical components in the brain. In essence, the mind is seen as a product of the body. Idealism, on the other hand, suggests that the physical world is a product of the mind. It points that the mind, or consciousness, is fundamental, and the physical world is a creation of projection on the mind's perceptions and experiences. Finally, neutral monism proposes that there is a neutral or underlying substance that gives rise to both mental and physical aspects of reality. In this view, neither the mind nor body is fundamental on its own, but both are derived from this neural substance. Monster of Udine The Monster of Udine is a little-known mystery that involved an unidentified serial killer who operated between the years of 1980 and 1989. He is believed to have killed at least four victims, but it's possible that he could be responsible for up to 16. The murders took place in the province of Udine in northeastern Italy, and most of the victims were sex workers, but some were housewives or just ordinary girls that ran into the wrong man. The four confirmed victims were found with a gaping incision in their abdomen, cut and cleaned with extreme care, most likely a scalpel or something similar. The incision was also notable that it was very close to that of a C-section, which has led detectives to believe he was a doctor. The four victims that were conclusively linked are that of Maria Belloni, a 19-year-old sex worker, on February 19, 1980, 22-year-old Luana Jumpacaro, who also was a sex worker, killed on January 24, 1983, Aurelia Janasevich, a 42-year-old sex worker, killed on March 3, 1985, and finally, Marina Lepre, a 40-year-old primary school teacher, killed on February 26, 1989. It's the murder of Marina that stands out, because on the same night she was killed, a few hours after the body was found, two officers on the scene were carrying out an investigation. When they began to hear the sounds of a man weeping and moaning, the officers followed the sound and came across a man around 60 years old, begging for forgiveness in front of the entrance of a church, with his arms stretched out to the sky. The officers approached the man and talked to him, and found out that he was a doctor who just happens to be a surgeon or a gynecologist, depending on which source you look at. They gave him a ride home, where they intended to question him, but his brother refused to allow them to without a warrant. The detectives couldn't do anything else, because they didn't really have any evidence. But seven years later, in 1996, they would reopen the investigation, and looked again at this man. Turns out, the doctor was never able to actually practice his profession, as he suffered from severe mental illness. His home would be searched, and nothing was ever found linking him to the crimes. He died in 2006, and detectives eventually stopped investigating him. As mentioned, there could be as many as 10 to 12 more victims, with the earliest taking place on September 21, 1971, when a woman named Irene Belletti was stabbed seven times, primarily in the back, while the last possibly linked victim, considered by most detectives, was that of Nicola Parabo, who had been found strangled and buried in 1991, although there were some similar murders in the area that did occur up to 2004, which if linked, would be over 30 years of the serial killer on the loose. But detectives have pointed out that due to the MOs being different, there may have actually been more than one serial killer operating at the time. In March 2019, following the discovery of some evidence, which had never been analyzed before, a request was made to reopen the code case. And that's the last update. Mothman. Right off, I have to say, the big mystery here is, how did Mothman get buried so deep on the iceberg? It's probably the second most well-known American cryptid after Bigfoot. On November 15, 1966, two young couples from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and Steve and Mary Millette, would report to police a bizarre creature they had seen. It was described as large, white with glowing red eyes, standing at the side of the road near the site of a former World War II munitions plant. Linda described it as, a slender, muscular man, about seven feet tall with white wings, and she said she was unable to discern its face due to its hypnotic effects of its eyes. Distressed, they drove away, and the creature chased them, making a screeching sound, before stopping near the city limits. Although this may be the most famous account, it was actually spotted by gravediggers just three nights before. They described it as a giant bird taking flight, but looked more like a man with wings, dark and brown, and looking grotesque. During the next few days, similar reports of sightings poured in after local newspapers documented it. Two volunteer firefighters reported seeing a large bird with red eyes. Others stated 
It was about six and a half feet to seven feet tall with a 10 foot wingspan and was flying close to 100 mile an hour. The sheriff chalked it up to an unusually large heron while a wildlife biologist at West Virginia University stated most of the sightings fit the Sand Hill Crane, which is almost tall as a man with a seven foot wingspan and having reddish coloring around its eyes. Although that bird is not native to the region, but it could have wandered out of its migration route. But it is the Silver Bridge Collapse on December 15th, 1967, that ended with the deaths of 46 people, that the Mothman become a legend, as the sightings of the creature in the area were thought somehow to be connected to the incident, or that it tries to warn people that disasters are about to happen, as it has been spotted all over the world in places such as Chernobyl. So most of you already know the history of the Mothman, but what are the explanations? Well, many sources claim that it is connected with UFOs, or possibly has some kind of connection to a military storage site that was alleged to be the Mothman's home, while other reports claim that at least 100 witnesses spotted the Mothman, while many, many more were too afraid to go public with it. The problem with all these claims is they come from dubious sources or unidentifiable sources, and it comes off like more of a folktale than anything else, especially considering there isn't one credible photograph or piece of evidence. A more plausible theory is that it was just hoaxes that followed the original report, such as a group of construction workers who tied flashlights to helium balloons shortly after the Mothman stories popped up in the papers. Another theory is that it's nothing more than owls, which would explain the glowing eyes that were actually red eye effect from flashlights and such. Still, many are adamant that the Mothman was an alien or previously unknown species of animal, or maybe another cryptid, that of the Thunderbird or Owlman which is a similar creature spotted near Cornwall in 1976. Mr. Poop, another pooper, this time in Tokyo, was reportedly captured relieving himself on the streets at least 10 times over three months in 2019 in the Akihabara district where numerous shops are located. This man, believed to be in his 30s, was caught in the act in at least one incident, which led him to fleeing the scene with his pants down. His targets included right outside of a restaurant, the entrance of an office building, the base of a utility pole, and a gap between two buildings. It got so bad that stores put up signs warning customers. Mile Joe, 56 building fire. We stay in Tokyo for this next mystery, which involved a structural fire at the Mile Joe 56 building on September 1st, 2011. The fire is the fifth deadliest in post-war Japanese history. It burned for five hours before being extinguished. It is suspected the fire was caused by arson, but no suspects were ever arrested. Media coverage was fairly substantial at first, which detailed the arrest and conviction of the property owners for criminal negligence, citing things like numerous fire code violations, including blocked fire doors and stairwells, and on the building's alleged ties to organized crime, that of the Chinese Mafia and Yakuza. Most suspiciously was a gas pipe on the third floor found detached from the gas meter. After the 9-11 attacks, it kind of fell off the radar. The fire originally broke out on the third floor where 19 people were, and 28 more were above them on the fourth floor. It's believed to have started, near ironically enough, the fire exit door in the elevator hall, and what would be a foreboding sign of things to come on 9-11, people here too would be seen jumping from the building, although these people survived. In total, 44 people died in the fire, with the vast majority being caused by carbon monoxide poisoning. As far as who was responsible, well, that's the mystery here. No one knows. Although, one injured man, seen near the burning building, disappeared and was never identified. Mystery Pooper of Broadway The last pooper story on this video, I promise. This one comes from 2019, and it occurs, and of all places, Broadway. When Pearl Studios decided to hold tryouts for Magic Mike the Musical, the actors would be stunned when they found the audition rooms had been turned into bathrooms. At first, they were hit with the smell, and naturally, they assumed someone had stepped in dog doo-doo outside, so they began to check their shoes, but they were finally able to find the source inside the building, and apparently, this went on over a few days during the auditions. And I think this is the first, but this one actually has a theory, and it's alleged to be over a dispute between union and non-union actors, stemming from the fact that the actors union has been urging Broadway theater goers to buy tickets that show strictly union productions. Nebular Hypothesis 
The nebular hypothesis is a scientific theory that explains the formation of our solar system. It proposes that the sun and the planets, including Earth, form from a giant cloud of gas and dust known as solar nebula. The hypothesis is widely accepted by the scientific community and provides a framework for understanding the origin of our solar system. According to the theory, our solar system began as a massive cold and dense cloud of gas and dust in space. This cloud, called the solar nebula, was composed primarily of hydrogen and helium, along with the traces of other elements. A triggering event, such as the shock wave from a nearby supernova, or the gravitational influence of a passing star, caused the solar nebula to start collapsing under the force of gravity. As it collapsed, it began to spin and flatten into a rotating disk. In the center of the spinning disk, a dense region known as the protosun formed. This protosun contained most of the mass in the nebula and would eventually become our sun. As material continued to accumulate onto the protosun, it heated up, initiating nuclear fusion and igniting as a star. In the surrounding disk, solid particles, or planetesimals, began to stick together and collide. These collisions led to the gradual growth of planetesimals into larger objects. Planetesimals continued to collide and accumulate material, forming even larger bodies called protoplanets. Over millions of years, these protoplanets grew in size and eventually became the planets of the solar system. The solar wind from the newly formed sun blew away the remaining gas and dust in the solar nebula, cleaning the inner solar system of most of its remaining material. This process allowed the planets to settle into their orbits. I actually don't know why this one is on the iceberg. I mean, I guess it's still technically a mystery when it comes to the formation of our solar system. But I mean, this theory is widely accepted. New England's Dark Day, May 19th, 1780, was the day of a particularly weird event in the northeastern United States and parts of eastern Canada. The earliest reports come from Rupert Vermont, which stated the sun was completely obscured at what should have been sunrise. Professor Samuel Williams of Cambridge would state that it got extraordinarily dark between 10 and 11 a.m. and stayed so up until the middle of the next night, while a Reverend Ebenezer Parkham in Westboro, Massachusetts, reported peak darkness around noon, but he did not mention when it first arrived. Harvard would report that it started around 10.30 a.m. and peaked at 12.45 p.m. and started slacking off by 1.10 p.m., but remained overcast the rest of the day. In other parts of Massachusetts, the sounds of birds and frogs that are typically heard as nightfalls were heard by 2 p.m. At least one witness reported a strong sooty smell in the atmosphere and that rain had a light film over it that was made up of particles of burnt leaves and ash. Other reports also indicated ash and cinders fell in parts of New Hampshire up to a depth of six inches. Others cited soot, which had been collected in rivers and in rainwater. There were also many that noted that the moon was colored red. Strangely enough, for several days leading up to the dark day, the sun in New England appeared to be red and the sky looked yellow. So what in the world happened? Not surprisingly, many people then and some even now, view this event under a religious microscope and assert that it's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. However, the most likely cause was smoke from extensive forest fires, for which there is actual evidence of. Fire scars in tree growth rings around the area of Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario shows evidence of a fire in 1780, and most scholars attribute the dark day to that. But others cite an unknown volcanic eruption or meteor strike, but others still cling to it being a biblical sign, and specifically cite Matthew 24, 29. Right after the trouble of these days, this will happen. The sun will become dark, and the moon will not give light. The stars will fall from the sky, and everything in the sky will be changed. But I ask you, what do you think? Hey y'all, this brings us to the end of this installment of Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. Goodbye, and good night.